Welcome to Bible Answers Live, where you'll get honest answers to your Bible questions. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With 66 books and more than 700,000 words, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. If you'd like answers to your Bible questions, you've come to the right place. Now, here's your host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, President and Speaker of Amazing Facts. Hello friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? Some described it as a hailstorm of biblical proportions. On June 5, 2018, severe storms swept through North Texas around the DFW area, pounding some communities with baseball-sized hail. Residents reported it sounded like the roofs were being beaten in with baseball bats. Skylights were shattered, car bodies and windshields destroyed, and trees were decimated everywhere. To confirm the unbelievable size of the hailstones, several residents collected and photographed samples. Some put them in their freezer so others could look at them later. According to the Insurance Council of Texas, approximately 20,000 structures and 25,000 vehicles were damaged for an estimated $425 million in losses. One resident said, I've been here my whole life in North Texas in the Dallas area, and I've never seen anything like this before. You know, the Bible says just before Jesus returns, they'll be the mother of all hailstorms. Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, honest answers to your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join our host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, and our co-host, Pastor Jean Ross. Welcome, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. And the reason we do this program is to study the Word of God with friends everywhere. If you have a Bible question, we have lines open. We don't know all of the answers, but we have a few of them at our fingertips in the Bible on our computers. And uh, between us, we probably got about 60 years of pastoring. So give us a call. It's 800-463-7297. That's 800, God says, 800-463-7297. We'll bring your questions into the studio here in Northern California. We're also streaming this live. If you want to tune in and watch, it's on the Doug Batchelor and the Amazing Facts Facebook pages. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is Jean Ross. Good evening, listening friends and Pastor Doug, as we always do. Let's start the program with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we can open up your word and study together this evening on a number of uh, questions and ideas and uh, various passages of scripture. So we do pray that your spirit would lead our thoughts and God, our discussion, lead us into a clearer understanding of what the Bible teaches in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, you opened the program by talking about a terrible hailstorm. Now, it's interesting when you look in the Bible, the Bible does speak about hail being used by God on several occasions to bring judgment upon the enemy of God's people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, actually, the Lord fought against some of the enemies of Israel when they were entering the promised land with hail. Of course, before the Exodus, one of the ten plagues, you read about this in Exodus 9, 23, and Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground, that's lightning, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt, so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy, there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation, and the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, and all that was in the field, both man and beast, and tells us prior verse they died and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field and i remember i was in, living in texas a few years ago we had hail that just it kind of scared us you look out the window it was walnut size hail not the baseball size hail they had at dfw but it <laughs> i had a little mazda glc and it was so sad because it came out not just my car but every car that was parked outside it looked like someone had taken a ball peen hammer and just beat up the top of the car. So the rest of the time I had that car, it, it looked like the surface of the moon. And I can't imagine, that was just 
walnut size hail if if you've got baseball size hail you can see actual pictures of it online these things are huge I remember hearing a story by HMS Richard Sr., who's the founder of the um, Voice of Prophecy radio program, when he was a young man preaching on Revelation one day. There were horses tied up outside. I, I, some atheist was mocking him in the congregation as he talked about the plagues. And uh, a hailstorm struck in Colorado right while he was preaching. And it's the stones were coming right through the roof into the meeting hall. And it killed the horses outside. And uh, it's a pretty dramatic story. That fellow was converted. That <laughs> <laughs> was making fun of the uh, sermon on Revelation. Now, what it says in Revelation, just one of the very last plagues it comes, Revelation sixteen twenty one, And a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone the weight of a talent. That'd be somewhere around 75 pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Well, the Bible tells us there is a day coming when uh, it'll be too late to pray and uh, God is going to punish the world for their iniquity. And uh, we want to know how to be ready before that day comes. We have a free offer that talks about that. We've got a book and we'll be happy to send this book out to anyone who calls and asks. It's called The Last Night on Earth. Again, this is free. All you'll have to do is call us on our resource phone line. The number is 800-835-6747 and ask for the book called The Last Night on Earth. We'll be happy to send that to anyone in North America. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.org or .com, and you can read the book for free online. It's called The Last Night on Earth, and I think you'll find it very enlightening as it talks about end-time events and uh, the second coming of Christ. All right, well, I think with that, we're probably ready to go to the phones. We still have a couple lines open if you give us a call. 800-GOD-SAYS. And who's first in line, Pastor Ross? We've got Ashley listening from Florida. Uh, Ashley, welcome to the program. Hi, good evening, Pastor. Evening. Thank you for calling. And your question tonight. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify Revelation um, chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. Um, it kind of seems like it's pointing towards an eternal hell. And so I just wanted some clarification on those verses. Yeah, if you read in uh, Revelation fourteen eleven, let me read it. And the smoke, speaking of the wicked, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Well, first of all, when it says smoke goes up forever and ever, uh, that simply says, you probably said, well, it went on forever, and that meant as far as you could see. And the smoke, it's like when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, and the Bible tells us the wicked will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And it tells us that uh, the smoke of the country went up like a furnace. And then um, it, it says, in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, you read in uh, it's Isaiah 60, is it 65, Pastor Ross, where it says they'll go forth and, or maybe it's 66, they'll go forth and look upon the carcasses of them that have transgressed against me, and their worm will not die, and they'll be abhorring to all flesh. It's talking about beholding the judgment of the wicked. And you're probably wondering about where it says day and night forever and ever. Well, first you've got to ask yourself, um, does that mean that the righteous are going to be forever and ever watching? And the Lamb and the holy angels, the wicked burning? The word forever there means uh, until they're all consumed. Now, someone's going to say, well, wait a second, does eternal life mean forever? Yeah. you got to read things in their context. The verse you're referring to there, Pastor Doug, was Isaiah 66, verse 24. You know, another way I, I heard this explained with reference to the smoke ascending forever and ever, the smoke is the consequence of the fire. And uh, some have seen it as emphasizing the fact that the consequence of the fire, meaning death, is eternal. It, there's no resurrection from the second death. So just as the smoke symbolically ascends up forever and ever, so the consequences of the judgment that comes upon the wicked, their eternal destruction, n is forever. There is no end to that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Well, one more thought now. Let's talk about the day and night. Okay. It says, they have no rest day or night who worship the beast. Now, obviously, the wicked are not in, in hellfire, still worshiping the beast. So now it's talking about back when they worship the beast. The people who worship the beast have no rest. Jesus had come unto me, and I'll give you rest. 
And so it's making a contrast between those who worship Christ have rest, those who worship the beast have no rest, they have no peace. Because obviously in hellfire, they're not still worshiping the beast because he's been cast in. Well, that'd be a pretty big mistake to worship the one who's been cast into hellfire. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So people emphasize the day and night forever and ever, and they think oh, that means they're burning forever and ever. It's actually making a different point in that part of the sentence. Hey, thank you, Ashley. And, you know, whenever you're in doubt about a Bible verse, you just create a little scale and you can get a piece of paper and say, here's the, you know, some people think that, that uh, the fires of hell are going to burn the wicked through eternity. List those scriptures. Then get the other scriptures and make a list. The scriptures that say they're consumed, they perish, they die, they're destroyed, never will they be anymore, no more pain, no more crying. And just start making a, a column and you'll see, wow, the, the preponderance of evidence is on the side that the wicked are ultimately consumed in the fires of hell. It's called the second death. And then there's a few difficult verses that you need to explain. So that's usually the best approach when there is some apparent conflict. Thank you so much. We do have a study guide dealing with the subject of hell, the destruction of the wicked, and it's called, Is the Devil in Charge of Hell? We'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. This is an important subject, and a lot of Christians don't quite understand what the Bible teaches on this, and uh, it's important for us to know it. Again, the study guide is called, Is the Devil in Charge of Hell? And the resource line is 800-835-6747. Want to know God's plan for our world and solutions for your life's challenges? Beautifully redesigned, Amazing Facts 27 Bible study guides provide encouraging Bible-based answers to questions on healthier relationships, when Jesus will return, and much more. Prefer to watch while you read? Our brand new Prophecy Encounters DVD series makes the perfect companion set. Order your study guides and DVDs today by visiting afbookstore.com or by calling 800-538-7275. We have Maya who is listening from Maryland. Maya, welcome to the program. Thank you for taking my call. Good evening, Pastor Doug and Pastor Ross. Evening. My question is, um, it says that in New Jerusalem, when New Jerusalem comes down, there will be four gates. Why do we, why the New Jerusalem will have gates? Usually we have gates to protect our homes from intruders. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, sometimes we think of gates as you're, you're worried about some enemy army invading. But uh, gates also are places in the Bible, gates, and first of all, there's 12 gates. There's three on each side, four walls. It says there's a gate is named for each of the tribes and the names of the apostles are in the foundation stones. But uh, gates are also in the Bible places where judgment happened. Gates were places where uh, folks would uh, hear stories from the elders. It was like a gathering uh, spot. And we're going to be able to fly. So, you know, the walls are not like keeping people out of the city. The Bible says they'll mount up with wings like eagle, eagles. And so... You know, you could fly over the gates if you wanted to. Uh, but I think it's a place where it just talks about you enter, uh, where those verses says we enter his gates with thanksgiving. So gates weren't always for war. It just represented a boundary. We finally enter the city of God. And of course, if you read in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. In chapter 20, it tells you when Jesus sets his feet uh, upon the Mount of Olives, it opens up, forms a great valley. The new Jerusalem comes to rest. And the wicked are resurrected. They're outside the city, and the righteous are inside the city. So I'm sure at that point, those gates will be closed for the great white throne judgment. Then the wicked mount their attack upon the New Jerusalem, and the Bible says fire comes and devours them. So when the New Jerusalem's on the earth, there will still be uh, the wicked outside the city and the righteous in the city until the final judgment occurs. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a lesson that talks about the New Jerusalem. And we'll be happy to send you a free copy of that, Maya. It's called A Colossal City in Space. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. The number again is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide on heaven. It's called A Colossal City in Space. Our next caller that we have is Tyler. And he's listening from Oklahoma City. Tyler, welcome to the program. Uh, hi. Hi. And your question? Uh, in Revelation 20... It talks about how um, that the wicked will charge to the New Jerusalem, and then they will be cast into the lake of fire. But then right after that, it says that in the great white throne of judgment, 
they will be cast into the lake of fire. So I had a confusion on when they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Well, both those verses are talking about the same event. It's referring back to the original event again. Well, the one time when it says they're cast into the lake of fire, then it gives you more details and it talks about it again. You know, we also find a feature that we, we see in Bible prophecy is a, you have a story or a, a particular subject presented, and then sometimes, as you read a little further, uh, the prophet is inspired to kind of back up and give you some additional details. For example, in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the wicked surrounding the golden city, the New Jerusalem, but you don't read until chapter 21 where the New Jerusalem's coming down out of heaven. So uh, those two chapters overlap a little bit with some of the details. It's not always in chronological order. And that's, I think, what confuses some people. So, Tyler, if I was just to tell you in, in layman's terms what's happening here in Revelation 22, it would be that um, the wicked surround Revelation 20 also. Uh, the wicked surround the city of God. They launch an attack. They're called Gog and Magog, all the wicked who've ever lived. And in the midst of that attack, Christ is exalted above the city on his white throne. There's a mass judgment that takes place. And uh, everyone whose names are not found in the book of life is cast into a lake of fire. Actually, God rains fire and brimstone down out of heaven upon them, forms a lake, just like any rain can eventually form a lake. And uh, they're, they've got the consequences of being in that lake of fire, and every man is punished according to what he deserves. So we've got a couple of questions on hell tonight. Now, that uh, your question would fit with our lesson on the millennium. Tyler, we have a special lesson on the millennium. We'll send you a free copy if you call. And that lesson is called A Thousand Years of Peace. And uh, to receive that, call 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide called A Thousand Years of Peace. Our next caller is Kathleen, listening from Arizona. Kathleen, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Hi, Dr. Uh, Pastor Doug and Pastor John Ross. Thank you for taking my call, and thank you for your ministry. Thank you. My question is uh, pertaining to Psalms 55. Uh, I was reading it, and it seems like David is asking God to destroy the people who who have hurt him. Um, I, I'm under the understanding that, that we, sh I don't know, I pray for people for God to soften their hearts, that they would turn to turn to God and uh, repent and be saved. <laughs> Should we pray for someone's destruction if they're arming us? Well, you know, David was a prophet, and so, you know, we don't have the insight he had. Uh, sometimes when a person is hurting others, um, even Jesus was so angry at the scribes and Pharisees because they were blind, leading others to destruction, the blind guides leading the blind. And some of the strongest things that Jesus said, he called them, you know, um, a brood of vipers. Well, I guess John the Baptist said that. And he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And so Jesus had some pretty strong language. And he said they would, there would be a severe judgment. He, he said, wept over Jerusalem and and talked about the severe judgment that was coming on them because they had stoned the prophets and done so many things. So David, David, as the king of the people, he's, he's, um, he's looking at the enemies of God's people and what they've done to hurt God's people. And uh, he wants them to stop hurting the innocent. So God has those same emotions. Okay. So, uh, like, I don't know when I see in the news where somebody, I don't know, has killed a kid or something. Um, I, I, of course, pray for their family for comfort and all, but I also pray for that person that they turn from you know, their ways. And so that's should appropriate. I not do that? <laughs> no, no, I think that's appropriate. You know, it, that's one thing that makes Christians unique is that we look beyond the sin and we realize that uh, if it wasn't for the grace of God, you know, human hearts can do desperately wicked and evil things. And we need to pray because there's stories in the Bible of even... There was a king that even killed his own children that later converted. It's hard to believe. So you never can underestimate God's power to transform someone. Maybe because David was a prophet, he knew that the, the one that was hurting him was uh, not going to change. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, and keep in mind, there there's two things that you see here in the Bible. One is the law that has to do with uh, interpersonal relationships. We should turn the other cheek. But then there's civil law where it talks about an eye for an eye. David here is probably speaking as a king and he's dealing with civil law and justice that must come upon the wicked. 
So you got several dynamics happening here. And thank you, Kathleen. We appreciate your question. Our next caller that we have is uh, Inez listening from Billings, Montana. Inez, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. And your uh, your question? Uh, we, My son and I have just been studying, and we are looking to see it, where in the Bible it says that we have a guardian, each one of us has a guardian angel. Well, there's a couple of verses. You don't find the word guardian angel in the Bible or the phrase, uh, but you do have a few verses. You can look at uh, Psalm 91, verse 11. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. And then there's the verse, and maybe Pastor Ross was looking that one up in Matthew. Matthew 18:10 It says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So guardian angels, particularly here, it's referring to little children and says uh, they're angels. So that would give you the idea of a guardian angel. And the Lord has no shortage of angels. The Bible describes them as, you know, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So, you know, God could appoint angels to watch over humans. We know the devil has evil angels that are trying to trip us up and tempt us. And not too many people argue that they are free of temptation. So if devil's got enough angels to go around and tempt us to sin, then we know that God has got two good ones for every bad ones. That's in Revelation, is it 12, where it says a third of the angels are cast out. Uh, Two-thirds were good. And they're there to help us resist the devil. What was that verse in Revelation? Revelation 12, it talks about Satan is cast out of heaven and his angels were cast out with him. And it says that he drew a third of the stars to the earth. And later it tells us these are the angels. So Satan was able to persuade one third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion against the creator. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, thank you. And uh, good question. We've got uh, Deborah listening in Burbank, California. Deborah, welcome to the program. Hi, Deborah. I was born in Burbank. I know. That's what I told him when I called in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we gave you uh, we gave you special access. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, why is there confusion over the number in the Godhead? Um, you mean being whether there's three be three individual persons or one? Yes. Well, you know, first of all, in in all honesty, uh, I think people in in our culture struggle with the idea of one. We always think when the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, we think about numerical quantity, that there's just one. But you read the rest of the Bible, and the word one did not always mean numerical quantity. It often meant unity. It's like Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Well, we know they're different persons because there at the baptism, you've got Jesus in the water, and God the Father says, This is my Son. And Jesus was not doing a ventriloquist job at that time. And uh, Christ said to the apostles, Father, I pray they may be one as you and I are one. And Jesus said, a husband and wife get married and they become one flesh. So the word one for the Hebrew often meant unity of purpose and direction that you're kind of one body. You know, when the Bible tells us that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image. So the plural is used there. There had to be at least two. And we read in the New Testament, there were three. Okay. So now I've got a book I just finished on this. I've always believed that there's three. Yeah, well, you're right. The, uh, I've got a book that I just wrote, because a lot of people have questions on this, and it's on the Trinity. It says, it's called The Trinity, One God or Three. And if you call Amazing Facts, we will send you a copy of that book. That'd be fabulous. I'd appreciate that. Sure. We got, I got a whole list in the back of the book of like 24 quotes from Scripture that mentioned the three persons of the Godhead in one or two verses together. The number to call for that is 800-835-6747. And again, just ask for the book on the Trinity. We'll be happy to send it to you. 800-835-6747. We've got uh, Jerry listening from Oregon. Jerry, welcome to the program. Uh, good evening, Pastors Ross and Bachelor. Um, always nice talking to you. Uh, I saw your sermon online uh, two days there, Saturday morning, and you mentioned that many, many people in mainstream Christianity believe that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday because Jesus 
was appeared on Sunday, which is true. I've heard that too. But my question to you, yes, it, the Bible makes it clear he was seen Sunday morning, but that doesn't mean he was necessarily resurrected on Sunday morning. He could have been resurrected 12 hours earlier. Do you, what, do you know any scriptures that, that pin down his actual time of resurrection? Well, I think there are scriptures. Um, you know, I'm looking right now in um, Luke chapter 24, verse 1, uh, and it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women came to the tomb bringing spices. They went and they didn't find the body of Jesus. Um, we believe that, you know, he had risen shortly before that. And I, I'm trying to remember which one of the Gospels it says the angel of the Lord descended and the soldiers did quake and he threw aside the stone. Is that Matthew 28? Let me see. Um, yeah, here it is. In Matthew 28, verse uh, 2, Behold, there was a great earthquake, and it says on the first day of the week, a great earthquake, the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it, and his countenance was like lightning. So the angel rolling back the door from which Christ ultimately emerges, that definitely happens Sunday morning. Well, yes, but he could have rolled away the stone just so that these ladies could go into the tomb. It still doesn't specifically say that Jesus was resurrected at that time. You know, I think that the, contextually it's clear, but yeah, I suppose you could argue that. Well, after you read the passage you just looked at, I think in Matthew passed it, it talks about the angel coming down from heaven. The soldiers fell to the ground as though they were dead. The angel rolled away the stone. Uh, doesn't specifically state that Jesus rose from the dead, but when the soldiers kind of came around, they got up and ran back to Jerusalem, and they gave the message that Christ was resurrected from the dead. So um, it was evident to them that Christ rose from the dead at the same time that the angel had rolled away the stone. Well, of course, the angel in Mark 16, he says that uh, he's not here, he is risen. I think the angel's making it sound like this imminently had just happened. Mm -hmm. That's in Mark chapter 16 and the first few verses. Hey, uh, we, we don't uh, mean to cut you off, Jerry, but we've got to take a hard break right now. We'll be back. More questions. Don't go away. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return in a moment. Deep within the pages of the Bible stories of great heroes heroes of great deeds great love and great sacrifice but behind them is another hero hidden in plain sight amid the shadows he was there from the beginning and he'll be there until the end Discover the golden thread of a Savior woven throughout the entire Bible tapestry. Shadows of Light. Seeing Jesus in all the Bible. Get your copy today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Once again, to purchase your copy of Shadows of Light, call 800-538-7275. If you enjoy hearing solid biblical answers on Bible Answers Live, you can have those same insights at your fingertips through the Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible. The updated hardcover version is available at its lowest price ever and includes the complete set of Amazing Facts 27 study guides, plus a Bible numbers and symbols chart and eight pages of colorful maps. This best ever Bible gives you a biblical cyclopedic index. Words of Christ in Red, Chronology of the Old Testament, along with Doug Batchelor's How to Study the Bible feature, and much more. Call us at AF Bookstore to learn more about it at 1-800-538-7275. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Every Bible question you have answered moves you one step closer to the fullness of God's will for your life. So what are you waiting for? Get the answers you need for a fuller, richer, more confident life. You're listening to Bible Answers Live. 
This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join pastors Doug Batchelor and John Ross for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends. And if you tuned in somewhere along the way, as you can tell, this is Bible Answers Live, and we are live, and we take Bible questions live. If you have a question, we've got lines open right now. It's a free phone call. And just simply dial 800-463-7297. An operator will pick up and kind of prep you for getting on the air, and we'll take your Bible question. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross, and we're going to go to our next caller. We have Scott listening in Nebraska. Scott, welcome to the program. Hello. Good evening, pastors. How are you all tonight? Good. How can we help you? My question is, um, at the end, when uh, we see Jesus coming in the clouds, where exactly is Satan going to be? Is he still going to be trying to deceive people? or um, I know he's going to be on the earth, but... Where exactly did Scripture does it say is he is he going to be when when all this happens? Well, some would argue that he's going to make some kind of a grand appearance in the Holy Land. Uh, it, they they read where it tells us, and this is Second Thessalonians, sits in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. Mm-hmm. I think Satan's going to maybe appear in a number of places around the planet, impersonate Jesus. Where he'll be geographically exactly when Christ comes, I don't know. But he might be in Washington, D.C. Uh, but he's going to be going around the planet, you know, impersonating Christ and trying to win people over to worship him. So we won't be able to see Satan as a glory of light and Jesus uh, coming in the clouds. Well, the glory of Christ when he comes is going to eclipse any earthly glory, any being on earth. Uh, there'll be nothing like it. Um, Satan, ha- you know, he's he's a created being. Some have argued, you know, is Satan going to appear as a man or is, is he somehow going to be, you know, taking on the form of a man? Uh, I don't think Satan has the power of incarnation like Jesus did. Uh, that, that's a mystery that only God could perform. But Satan is somehow going to appear in the form of a man to deceive humans. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Or he may possess, he may just thoroughly possess an individual. Uh, you know, he's done that in history before. Okay. Well, I appreciate your answers. Well, very good. Thank you, Scott. And, you know, some of these things we're just going to have to, uh, we're going to have to wait and see. Of course, we're not looking forward to that part of the story. We do have, uh, we got a lesson we can send you on the Antichrist. And it's simply called, Who is the Antichrist? And we'll be happy to send this to you, Scott, or anyone who'd like to receive it. The number is 800-835-6747. And again, you can ask the study guide called, Who is the Antichrist? Again, 800 800- Eight three five six seven four seven. Next caller that we have is Mac, listening from uh, Washington. Mac, welcome to the program. Good evening, Pastors. How are you? Great. Thank you for calling. Well, I have uh, the question that I have has to do with um, asking the Lord for signs. Uh, you know, if if there's uh, you know you have a decision you need to make in your life and you you want the Lord's input on it, and you know I've read in different places that we shouldn't tempt the Lord that way or try him that way. But then there's stories about Gideon and the, and the fleece on the ground. So I just wanted some clarification about that. Yeah, well, you're right there. You know, Christ does say in Matthew chapter, what is it, 12, verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So Christ is not condemning there or ever asking for some divine guidance. You know, of course, he wants us to follow his word. So sometimes if you want leading, to look in the word. And sometimes he'll speak through Christian counsel, other believers that have wisdom. He'll guide us with the impressions of his spirit. But I've been in situations before, I think a lot of Christians have, where you just, you had two good alternatives. You just say, Lord, I need some additional evidence to make my decision. And I, I've seen where God has given signs. The disciples, when they needed to pick a new apostle to replace Judas, they cast lots. That's essentially asking for a sign. You know, sometimes the the Lord would, uh, he'd give some providential evidence that would guide people. But I think most of all, Christ said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. 
So when he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees and he said it's an evil generation that seeks after a sign, Christ was saying, look, you've got the sign of the prophets to know that I'm the Messiah. You don't believe the prophets, you won't believe me. You shouldn't be asking for a sign that I'm the Messiah. I don't think that was a blanket statement. We should never ask for any kind of extra evidence. I know a lady that was really praying whether or not she should marry a man and a very godly woman. It's just not knowing and just wanting to know. She, and she knelt by her bed and opened the Bible and closed her eyes, flipped through the Bible, just put her finger down on a page. And she put her finger down on the part in Genesis 22, I think, where, uh, where they're looking for a wife for um, Isaac. And it says, you know, if he bids you, go with him. <laughs> and she, she married the guy and was happily married. But she says she just needed a sign. <laughs> so sometimes God does that. But it's best not to depend on flipping coins and looking for signs. Well, I, I, I guess what I wanted to know is there's, there's lots of times that, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and, you know, I'm, I'm looking to do the Lord's work at every chance I get. And then it's just sometimes, you know, I just want to know, is this what you want? You know, what is what is your purpose for my life sort of thing, you know? Uh -huh. And and there are things that I would do or think of doing, and I would say, well, Lord, is this it? You know, if this is it, show me this sign or show me that sign, you know? So, I mean, how does that how does that work? The, the best thing is say, Lord, guide me, and then start reading the Bible. And you'll find that I, the Lord will bring you to passages. It's like he's saying, I speak to you primarily through my word. He will lead you to passages. Now, I've got a book I can send you where I talk specifically about this, Henry, and it's called How to Know the Will of God, and it talks about looking for leading in these situations. Again, the number to call for that is 800-835-6747, and ask for the book called Determining the Will of God, and we'll be happy to send that out to you, Mac, or anyone who calls and asks. Our next caller that we have is Henry, listening from New York. Henry, welcome to the program. Uh, yes, I'm from the Bronx, New York. Uh, and the blessed New Year to both of you. Thank you. Was Moses before Cleopatra or after Cleopatra? Moses was before Cleopatra. Yeah, Cleopatra lived closer to the time of uh, Julius Caesar, and that would have been about uh, 50 B.C., and Moses lived about 900 years before that. So, yeah, he definitely li lived uh, quite a ways before then. So when he was in Egypt, long before Cleopatra came around. All right, thank you for your call, Henry. Our next caller that we have is uh, Latham, listening from Alberta, Canada. Latham, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, my question is, if God knows the future so well, why did he create Lucifer? Well, God creates creatures free, and the Lord was willing to make Lucifer, uh, even though God knew that he might rebel. It's like... Um, when your parents decided to have children, they probably knew in advance that the children may not always obey them, but they wanted to love their children, and so they took the risk. Well, God, he doesn't make us robots. He makes us free. And so God even made a, an angel that had the potential to go bad. Lucifer's going bad was his decision. It wasn't God's choice. God is a loving God, and that's why he does that. You know, we have, Latham, we have a, a study guide called Did God Make a Devil? And it talks about, uh, you know, why would God create an angel that he knew could go bad? And to receive that study guide, all you'll have to do is call our resource phone line. That's 800-835-6747. And again, after that study guide called Did uh, God Create a Devil? And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Next call is uh, Pochi, I guess, listening from Florida. Pochi, welcome to the program. Yes, how are you doing? Uh, my question is on the 
take uh, the version of uh, then we which which are alive and we men shall be cut up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians 4, yeah. Yes, yes. Now, would that be, is that the 144,000? That's caught up in the air. Is that the... Well, they may be some of them, but we don't think it's only 144,000 that are saved because when you read in Revelation chapter uh, 7 and 14, where it talks about the 144,000, principally chapter 7, it says there's also a great multitude that no man can number. The 144,000 will certainly be part of that group, but they're not the only ones. Oh, there's going to be another group that's there also when Christ returns. Yeah, well, you, the 144,000, just it says there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of a spiritual term talking about those who have come to believe in Jesus. There may be some literal Jews and spiritual Jews in that group, but they're like leaders, like the 12 apostles were leaders. They were not the only ones that Jesus saved. At Pentecost, there were 120 in the upper room, and then through their preaching, there was 3,000 saved. And that all began with the 12 apostles Jesus trained. So the 12, the, the 144,000, if only 144,000 are saved, and now there's, you know, pushing 8 billion people in the world, I did the math once, and that would mean your chances of being saved are 1 out of 50,000. So that's pretty sad. You know, I wouldn't want to be hoping that I'm 1 out of 50,000. There's going to be a lot more than that saved in the last days. You know, we do have a book talking about the 144,000. We'll be happy to send that to you. It's called Who Will Sing the Song? Understanding the 144,000. The number to call is 800-835-6747. And again, the book is called Who Will Sing the Song? Understanding the 144,000 that we read about in Revelation. Amen. Thanks for your call. Our next call is Alan listening from Mississippi. Alan, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Truly a pleasure, gentlemen. You've blessed me for years. Well, thank you. Appreciate your calling. Well, thank you, sir. In Numbers 13.1, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. Numbers 13.1 says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan. Yes. It, then, in Deuteronomy 1.22, it appears that the Israelites came to Moses said, let's send some spies, and Moses said, it seemed like a good idea to me. Yeah. You said, wondering, it sounds like a contradiction? Yes, sir. Well, the way I've had it explained in looking at the different commentaries is it was initially the people's idea. They went to Moses, said, you know, Moses, you've actually never been in the promised land. Moses, you know, he wandered 40 years in the wilderness. He never crossed the Jordan. And the other Israelites had not been there, you know, for several generations. They said, we probably ought to send some surveillance out there to see what's going on you know we don't know god's promised this land but all we have is hearsay and so it was the people's lack of faith initially they said let's send some spies now it wasn't necessarily a bad idea to have spies because later joshua 40 years later joshua sends spies and joshua was one of the original 12 spies so god then consents and what you're reading in numbers 13 is god consenting to the request of the people so the Lord said to Moses, send men to spy out the land. But he's now responding to a request that's already been made by the people. So the, the idea started with the people. And Moses said, well, it sounds good, Lord. They want to send spies. And God said, okay. But it wasn't initially God's idea. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Next caller that we have is uh, Damien listening from Miami, Florida. Damien, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good night. Pastor Doug and Pastor Ross. Evening, and how can we help you tonight? Okay, I was reading Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27. What does it mean to be created? God created man in his own image. Yeah, that's great. Well, God actually has a, a form. So for one thing, man is made in a similar form of God. God does not look like a giraffe or a zebra or a mouse or a flying squirrel. Uh, if we want to know something about what God looks like, we look like him. Um, just like a child may have a striking resemblance to its parents. God has a head and hands and feet like us. He walks up uh, erect. There are a couple of images where you see God in the Bible. In uh, Daniel chapter 4, Daniel 7, Revelation 1, Ezekiel. I don't remember what chapter. But these different prophets saw the Lord Isaiah 6, sitting, God sitting on a throne He's got, you know, eyes and hair and, and, and clothes like a human. So we're made in that form in the image of God. But man is made in the image of God in that God creates 
and man was made to procreate in our image. So when we have children, like God, we have children in our own image. God is a ruler. Man was made to be the ruler of this planet. God gave dominion of the world to Adam and Eve. So that's another way that man is made like God. And there are many other characteristics and emotions we have that we get from God. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you, Damien. Appreciate that. Good question. Our next call is Roger, listening from Colorado. Roger, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. My question concerns something that was asked earlier. Okay, when Jesus was resurrected from the grave, I understand somebody had said something about that there were other resurrections at about the same time. Is that true? Well, they're talking in Matthew 20, is it Matthew 27, 20, Matthew 52. 27, 52. It tells us that at the time that Christ died, there was an earthquake. Many of the graves around Jerusalem were shaken open. And after the resurrection of Christ, some of them came out of their graves and appeared to people in the city. They, we understand, ascended to heaven when Christ did. So there was a small group of people that were resurrected at the same time as Christ, according to Matthew chapter 27. Well, I thank you very much for that, and thank you also for Friday night Bible question. Oh, thank you. We appreciate your calling. Uh, take care, Roger. You got it. Thank you. Next caller that we have is Joe listening from uh, Pennsylvania. Joe, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good evening, Pastor. Evening. Thank you for calling. Yes. I would I would like your comments on Matthew fifteen ten through twenty and Mark seven fourteen through twenty one. I know you probably answered this a hundred times, but unfortunately I've never heard your answer. These scriptures talk about the what goes into the body does not defile the body, it is what comes out of the body. And to me, it seems to be talking about food because it says what goes in is eliminated. Correct. Yeah, what Paul, what, uh, the, the issue here, though, is not a particular kind of food. What the dispute is over is the religious leaders were giving the apostles a hard time because they did not ceremonially wash their hands before they ate. And Jesus said, you know, don't you realize that that's not what defiles you. If you eat with dirty hands, it doesn't defile your heart. He wasn't making that statement as a blanket that a person can eat anything that might crawl across their plate, that now people, you know, that the unclean foods suddenly were cleansed. Some people read it that way. But Jesus is talking to Jews. They, they had no discussion. There was no dispute here about what clean foods were and unclean foods. The dispute here is if you wash, if you eat with unwashed hands, ceremonially unwashed hands, does that defile your heart? Jesus said, no, you know, we eat a certain amount of bacteria every day. And it goes through your digestive system. That's why Christ said purging all meats. There's a certain purging that takes place. And it, like you say, it's eliminated. It kind of goes in and comes out. And it, it doesn't defile your heart. But, you know, God blessed Daniel when Daniel said he would not defile himself with the unclean foods that the king of Babylon was wanting to feed them. Also, the religious leaders in the time of Jesus laid a heavy burden upon the people, the common people. And in order for them to eat, they would have to go through the ceremonial washing. Otherwise, they would be defiled. And um, I, this was difficult for a lot of the common people, especially the poorer people. And Jesus, in this whole passage, was talking to the religious leaders and said, you are making void the law of God by your man-made traditions. And then he uses this one, for example, the washing of cups and ceremonial washing of the hands. And then he called the multitude together. This is the people. And he said, understand, it's not... You know, what goes into the mouth, meaning it's not the ceremonial washing of the hands and the cups that's really the most important thing. It's what comes out of the heart. So Jesus was illustrating that truth. The context there is these traditions created by the religious leaders. Yeah, and then later in Matthew chapter 12, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and we're defiled by our words, actually. We'll be judged by our words. If you're wondering about whether God still cares if we eat clean or unclean food or what Jesus' teaching was on that, you jump to Acts chapter 10, which happens about four years after the death of Christ. Peter has a vision, and he says, Not so, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So if the disciples, who lived surrounded by Greeks and Romans, were thinking it was okay to eat anything, well, they sure weren't doing it even four years after Christ. Because Peter says very explicitly, I've never eaten anything common 
and he never takes anything out of this visionary sheet and eats it. So uh, that was a vision about preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Right, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, uh, buzzards and skunks and camels are still unclean. I want to eat them. <laughs> yeah, I, I just heard a pastor say one time, he said, you know, if, if you say that every creature of God is good and you think that you can eat any living thing, well, technically that would be an endorsement of cannibalism. So God is not saying that. Mm -hmm. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Next caller that we have is Lindsay listening from Michigan. Lindsay, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug and Pastor Ross. Hi, thank you for calling. Yes. Um, so my question is, is did people back in Bible times know that they were fulfilling prophecy? And a couple of examples that I was wondering about was when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus, um, when Herod commanded the slaughter of children, and uh, when Jesus uh, rode the donkey. Uh, I know that it was all prophesied, I think, in the book of Isaiah. I'm not for sure, uh, but I was just curious about that. Yeah, well, when Christ rode the donkey... I think that's Zechariah. He knew. Yeah, Jesus knew. Um, when Joseph, now I know you were talking about Joseph, Jesus' father. When Joseph, the patriarch, was in Egypt, near the end of his life, he told his brothers, I know that the prophecy God gave me as a young man, that you'd all bow down to me and that he would bring good out of it. Now I know what that prophecy is all about. So Joseph lived to see a prophecy God gave him fulfilled. Uh, that's Joseph, the son of Jacob. I don't think Mary and Joseph realized when they tied off their donkey in Bethlehem before Jesus was born, hey, let's hurry up and go fulfill this prophecy. I think it was the last thing in their mind. Mary had been told by Gabriel that you're going to have the Messiah, but I'm not sure that they, they were going to Bethlehem because there was a tax and they had to go. I don't think they thought, let's hurry and get there so that we could look like we're fulfilling Micah's prophecy. What do you think? Yeah. No one's ever <laughs> asked me that before. So those scrolls were not available well, no, they had the scrolls, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of prophecies in the Bible. I'm not sure that they had made the connection because Micah's prophecy, Bethlehem, out of you will come forth he who will be savior. I, I'm not sure that they had always put two and two together on that. We're pretty certain that Herod did not realize that he was actually fulfilling Bible prophecy when he had all the little baby boys put to death. Um, of course, that was a fulfillment of prophecy that you read later on. But in the story of the wise men that came from the east and they saw the star. They had been studying the scriptures and they understood that that had prophetic um, importance. And so they followed the star. So, yeah, there are some who recognized the fulfillment of prophecy and, and some who didn't. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for all your work. Yes, I really appreciate it. All right. God bless. <laughs> have a good one. Next caller that we have is Jim listening in Oregon. Hey, Jim, we've got about a minute and a half. Can we do it? Oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> we'll try. The top of your millennium where the the people of God are in heaven and the new Jerusalem comes down and and Jesus resurrects the wicked dead. Uh, then Satan is loosed from his chains because the wicked dead are now alive. But then it says that he is is loosed and the season a season where the day is a year, the season is three months, then that He's going to be tempting the wicked, deceiving them for 90 years. All right. So what Jim is, let me just repeat your question because you're cutting in and out. Uh, we're going to put you on hold, mute here because we're getting some feedback. I think Jim is asking when it says in Revelation 20 that Satan is loose from his prison for a little season and he'll go out and deceive the nations. How long is that little season? I, I think it's a phrase that is used. It's indefinite. The closest I've heard is, you know, Moses, he refused to be called a son of Pharaoh, rather willing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And some have said, well, that was 40 years or 80 years. And so I've heard arguments about, you know, maybe Moses' life. A, a season there it just means a spell of time. You know, a season for us can be the, what do you call it, the cycle of the seasons, which is one year. If you look at the translation of this in the New King James, verse 3, it says, shall be released for a little while. 
So they don't use the word season, they just say a little while. Yeah, that kind of su- that sums it up. Hey, I hope that helps a little bit, Jim. We appreciate your question. I don't know that we'd have time to do justice to our last caller, Angelita. Give us a call next week. If you don't mind giving us a call, we'll try and put you at the head of the, the list here. Listening friends, before you go away, let me just remind you that Amazing Facts has a broad spectrum of ministry. This Bible Answer program is a service we do once a week because we just love to study the Word with people and get the truth out there. We've got a Bible school. We have missionary training. We have television programs around the country. We're on stations like TBN and Daystar and Lifetime and many others. Hope you'll go to our website and check out Amazing Facts. It's simply amazingfacts.org. And keep in mind, everything we do is only by the grace of God working through you. We have no corporations or denominations that underwrite us. It's just folks like you that say, hey, I've been blessed. I want to help you keep going. You can go to Amazing Facts and click donate and you'll know what to do. Thank you so much for studying the word of God with us. And God willing, we'll be back together again to do it again next week. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts, a faith-based ministry located in Sacramento, California. Hello friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor here with Amazing Facts. Corrine was divorced, pregnant, and very concerned about her future. But God saw her in her desperate loneliness and confusion, and he used a coworker to share an Amazing Facts DVD that led Corrine to our website. Here at the website, she studied our life-changing free online Bible studies. What she learned there transformed her heart, and today, Corrine has a lasting peace. She's baptized and part of a nurturing church family. Now you, friend, have an opportunity to help someone today and to make an eternal difference for more people like Corrine. Your simple investment of faith in Amazing Facts will keep growing and reaching more people with God's life-changing Word. Would you prayerfully consider sending a gift today to help others know Christ and the wonderful truth that changes hearts? And it's easy to make a donation. Give us a call at 877-506-1751. The number again, 877-506-1751. Or just visit give.amazingfacts.org or send your gift to P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Thank you for studying the Word of God with me today. And I hope that you'll plan now to join me again next week as we discover more amazing facts from the Word of God. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters. Enhance your knowledge of the Bible and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. For life-changing Christian resources, visit AFBookstore.com or call 1-800-538-7275. If you'd like to enhance your study of God,